Hello and welcome. The great leader Abraham once said, nearly all men can face adversity, but if you really want to test a man's character, then you have to give him power. What an amazing quote by one of the great leaders of the past, a leader that inspired a whole nation, a leader that influence still extends to this day. And of course, I'm speaking about the great Abraham Lincoln. However, the focus of today's talk is on another Abraham, another Abraham whose influence extends even further, a man with many titles. He was known as the great leader, the father of monotheism, and of course, the friend of God. The prophet Abraham is the person I'm talking about. And he was a man that unites the three monotheistic faiths across the world, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So the prophet Abraham, when we look at his life, he lived in the ancient city and civilization of Babylon. And when we think about Babylon and that ancient civilization, we think about the great hanging gardens, we think about the great structures and buildings, and of course, let's not forget the Tower of Babel. And also, Babylon and the city he was from was the center for over nearly two millennia of the great Mesopotamian civilization. But what was life like during that time? Was it different from the life of today? And if we reflect and we think about it, to be honest, life was very similar. I mean, there was a society that had a rule of law, they had leaders that they followed. There were people that were living their lives, trying to earn a living. They had businesses, they were educating themselves. And also they had families that they had to take care of, look after, clothe, shelter. And they had relationships that they had built with their friends and society. So they had people that they loved and cherished. However, one thing that is strikingly different from that society to the society of today is that they actually performed idol worship. And that was no different from the time of the prophet Abraham. In fact, his father was the chief idol maker for the great temple. Now, when we think about idol worship, we think about these great structures, these great idols that are built by stone and the great civilizations of the past, they all had idol worship in one shape or form. For example, the Mesopotamian, uh, civilization, the great Egyptian civilization, even the Greek civilization. And what we can see from this is that humans, they would worship these idols. They would put their hopes, their trust, their gratitude, their thanks into these things. And they would do that because they held the belief that these idols held some sort of power. And this is the reality of ancient idol worship, right? And the prophet Abraham, he lived in a society that performed idol worship. And the idol worshippers of that time, they would take their worship very seriously, right? They would go to extremes in their idol worship. They would paint their faces with paint, right? Colorful paint. They would wear these extravagant costumes and they would do these ceremonies of worship that would involve chanting and they would do these ritualistic dances all as part of their ritualistic ceremonies and also as part of their worship they would have huge enormous temples temples that they would focus their worship on and no, no expense was spared in these, these, these great buildings and they would hold ceremonies in these uh, great buildings and often the idols would be housed in these enormous temples and they would also offer sacrificial worship. So when we think about ancient worship, you know, ancient worship is something that when we think about from a historical point of view, is something that involved a huge ritualistic tradition. And when we think back, most of human history has been involved in some form of idol worship. And most of these civilizations, they would perform these, these celebrations and often it would lead to one, commu uh, uh, one big celebration that they would sort of celebrate annually. And during the time of Prophet Abraham, that was no different. In fact, when we look at his story, there was a time where his society was going to perform one such celebration on the outskirts of the city of Babylon. 
Now the prophet Abraham, he didn't really want to attend this celebration because from a young age, he realized something. He realized that he would see his father, the chief idol maker, make these idols with his hands, right? And people would go up and offer their worship and their sacrifice to these idols. But he realized that these idols in, in of themselves, they held no power. So when this celebration happened, he didn't want to partake. He decided to stay at home and he told the society that he was sick. So he stayed in the city, the ancient city of Babylon, whilst the rest of the community, they left and they went to perform this celebration of worship. Now, when we look at this whole sort of idea and notion of idol worship, it's something that seems old, outdated, ancient, something that doesn't really apply to the 21st century, right? Because these are things done by the human beings of the past. It's not something that is relevant in today's society. In fact, we're living in a society of science, technology, we've advanced so much, we understand the world so much better. But what's interesting is if we think and think again, actually the idols of the past have been replaced. The great idols that were carved out in stone and wood have been replaced by modern day idols. And these idols are the idols of the pop stars, the idols of the actors, and the idols of the singers. And millions of millions of people in today's day and age, they worship these modern day idols. And examples of them, as you can see on the screen, David Beckham, Justin Bieber, and also Tom Cruise. And in fact, just like the idols of the past, they also have these great sort of statues built in reverence for them where people sort of commemorate them, right? So here you see the idol of David Beckham, the idol of uh, Tom Cruise and Justin Bieber at Madame Two Swords. Also, when we think about these sorts of idol worshippers, what's interesting is that these idol worshippers of today, they sort of really obsess about these people really take this sort of obsession to another level and basically they literally center their whole life around these idols that they you know they revere and worship and an interesting thing about this is that there is a modern day term that describes this sort of symptom and it's actually called celebrity worship syndrome and this is a type of behavior which is an obsessive addictive disorder in which the person becomes completely obsessed in the person's lifestyle and personal life. And what's, interested, what's interesting about this, right, is when we look at these idol worshippers, is that usually they worship and they idolize people from, uh, people from a, a pop background or from the music industry or from the arts industry. But one thing that they have in common is they are people of, of a public nature. They are people in the public eye. And when it comes to this syndrome that affects society today, the, the syndrome of celebrity worship uh, syndrome, is psychologists have even categorized the different levels of obsession, right? And they include, and I'm going to read it, it says, simple obsessional, love obsessional, erotomanic, entertainment social, intense personal, and borderline pathological. And that's the modern day idol worshippers. And just like the idol worshippers of the past, they also have huge, enormous temples or arenas where they come to worship their idols. Right? And we see that today. And we see the huge towering construction buildings of the modern day arenas, the modern day stadiums and the modern day halls. And, you know, when we look at these modern day buildings, they are architectural masterpieces. Right? And no expense is, is, is left when it comes to building these great buildings. In fact, one of the most iconic stadiums in the world, Wembley Stadium, they spent a staggering, and they say, over one billion pounds in constructing this building. Well, that's phenomenal when you just think about it. So these are the idol worshippers of today. You know, they worship the idols 
from the idols of celebrities, the idols who are the pop stars, the idols that are the singers, the idols that are from the different industries that they look up to, the public figures. And the idol worshippers of today, just like the idol worshippers of the past, they would paint their faces, they would wear ridiculous costumes, and they also have chants, and they have dances that they perform. So this is the link between the idol worshippers of the past and modern day idol worship, right? And what's interesting is when we reflect over these two types of worship, ancient idol worship and modern day idol worship, we can see similar striking commonalities. And that commonality is that the human seems to need or have this desire to worship something, right? It's something that is internal within them. And we see this throughout history. Humans are naturally wired to put their hopes, loves and desires into something that is external, right? And this is natural to all of human beings. But the question arises, is who really deserves this worship? This level of gratitude and thanks and the love that we give, who really deserves that? Now if we go back to the story of ancient Babylon and Abraham, remember I said Abraham was born into this ancient civilization of Babylon where they used to perform idol worship and they used to have these huge ceremonies. So in one such ceremony, Prophet Abraham at a young age he realized these idols have no power. So he decided to sit this one out, right? He stayed in the city. So what he did was he took the opportunity to smash all the idols in the city. Yes, he smashed every single idol apart from one. And what he did was the axe that he used to smash those idols, he left it next to the largest idol in that city. So you could imagine when the rest of the community came back, they were happy, they just performed their celebration. They were in a state of shock. Couldn't believe it. Who could have done such a thing? Who could have smashed all of these idols? So they remembered that Abraham, the young Abraham, he was the only one left in the city. So they called him in for questioning. Maybe he saw someone that had done something to their idols. So when they asked him, Abraham, who did this? He replied by saying, why don't you ask the huge idol that has the axe next to him? The community was dumbfounded and enraged because they knew what had happened. They knew from that response that the prophet Abraham at a young age had smashed all the idols, but it also led to a realization of something else that these idols within themselves, they have no power. They can't communicate and they definitely can't protect themselves. So here, Abraham was trying to do something. He was trying to get the people to use their intellect, their rationality, their reason to understand these things are of no use. They're completely useless, right? And that's what happened during his time. And so when we talk about idol worship of the past and modern day idolatry, it's no different, right? We have to reflect, just like Abraham tried to get his people to reflect and think about who really deserves that level of thanks, gratitude and worship. And of course, the prophet Abraham was pointing to the one true God that deserves our love and worship. Now, when we think about worship and modern day idolatry and we think about you know these people that we look up to these sports stars these guys that are the pinnacle of their arena it's natural that whenever we see a level of performance at that level of intensity it is something that is amazing it is phenomenal and it stirs great emotions within us right and that's natural for example if we take the example of Muhammad Ali when he fought George Foreman in that historical boxing event and fight, Rumble in the Jungle, and he threw that right hand that knocked out George Foreman, that inspired millions of people across the world. They were ecstatic, they were overjoyed. In fact, 
in the words of the novelist Thomas Hauser, he says it was a moment that inspired more global joy than any athletic achievement in history. So when we see such amazing performances, we can't help but stand and give a standing ovation. And there is an outcry of emotion, right? This is natural. But if we take a step back and reflect for a moment, of course, what Muhammad Ali achieved was amazing and phenomenal. But we have to ask the question, who truly is responsible for a man like Muhammad Ali? After all, Muhammad Ali is a human being, just like you and me, right? And as human beings, we didn't decide upon our creation or our own existence, right? We didn't even decide the color of our skin, the color of our eyes, the color of our hair. We didn't even decide our gender, yet we were thrown into this existence that we call life. And what a brilliant life it is, right? And everything that we love, we hold dear, and that is special to us, is a blessing that has been given to us. So who truly deserves that level of worship and love and gratitude for this existence that we call life, right? Now, if I give you a simple example, say, for example, I'm a wealthy human being, right? I'm the richest man alive, and I have everything that I ever want. But what I want from you is I want both your eyes. So I offer you 10 trillion pounds for both your eyes. Now, are you going to sell me your eyes? Of course not. Of course you won't sell me both your eyes. Why? Because your eyes are priceless. There's nothing that can replace your eyes. No materialistic thing can replace your eyes. They are a blessing. Or what about the analogy of, let's say, Again, I'm a wealthy individual and, you know, me and you, we became friends. And what I wanted to do was give you a gift, give you a gift of 10 million pounds. Because For me, it's nothing, right? But for you, it's going to be life changing. And there's no strings attached. And as I give you that gift, you can do whatever you want. You can, you know, spend the money on your family, buy a new house, a new mansion, a new palace, new cars go on holiday, go on vacation, give it to charity, help others, it's up to you. But the point I'm trying to make here is, whenever anyone gives you a gift, the natural thing to do is say thank you, right? And be grateful. What would be absurd is if I gave you that gift and you start thanking David Beckham or Tom Cruise or even Justin Bieber. Do they really deserve that level of worship? Of course not. They're not the ones that are responsible for what has been given to you. You see, and we have to understand who we are as human beings. You see, as human beings, we are complex beings. We have a spiritual aspect to us. We, we are not just a product of a random blind process with no guiding hand, right? We are not just a rearrangement of matter. Our lives matter and they are precious. So the problem is, in the 21st century, we forgot who we are. That we are these complex beings that are spiritual, physical and mental. And all of this needs to be satisfied. Our spiritual side needs to be satisfied. So what we understand from this is that our lives are precious and we need to be grateful for every moment of our lives. Every heart, heartbeat, every moment is something that is precious and something that we should cherish and make the most of. So how do we worship according to the way of the prophets, according to what was understood by the prophet Abraham? Well, it's very simple. The way we worship is by first understanding who is truly deserving of our worship. And that is Almighty God, the sole creator, sustainer of the entire cosmos and everything that exists. Every single blessing, like your eyesight, is because of Almighty God. And Almighty God is the one that deserves our worship. So the first point 
of worshipping God is to get to know God. Know who God is. Know the nature of God. Know the names and attributes of God. Because once you understand God, you will quickly come to the realization with the knowledge that God is the all-knowing, the all-powerful, the all-loving, the all-wise. And once you know this and then all the blessings and the beauty that we see in life is a result of this almighty God, then quickly what will happen is you will then develop a great sense of love. And that's the second aspect of worship, is that we should love God, that we will develop this great sense of love and this great relationship. Because whenever anyone gives you something or does something nice to you, you want to be grateful and thanks and you want to develop that relationship and you want to reciprocate and give it back, give back from yourself. So you develop a great deep level of love, the highest level of love, because everything that you have in your life is a direct result of God. And then the third aspect of that would be because you know who God is and you love God, you understand that all good comes from Almighty God. So whatever he commands, because he is our creator, he is the one that knows us better than we know ourselves, would be good. So whatever he commands, we would obey. We would obey his commands because we know these commands are all good and they are, what, they are what's best for us. And we would submit to them. And finally, what we would do is we would single out all acts of worship to this God alone, who really deserves our worship. Not the false idols of today or the ancient idols of the past, but the one true God, which is almighty God, the God of Abraham. Now, the problem that we have today in the fast moving pace of the 21st century is that, like I said, we have forgotten who we are. And we have forgotten this spiritual aspect to ourselves. And what we've done is we've tried to fill this spiritual void with useless alternatives. And one such example of these alternatives is this idea of individualism and egocentrism. This idea that you're independent, you're free of need, you don't need anything, I can provide for myself. And the problem with that, it develops characteristics which are really bad, such as being egocistic, egocentric, Statistical, self-centered, selfish, not being concerned with others, you know, and this is really a satanic mentality because the devil, he had the same characteristic, this idea of always trying to look good, even at the expense of others, this idea of not, never wanting to accept faults, always wanting to be right, you know, imposing your right upon others and at the expense of others and never wanting to be wrong. And this is what's known as self-worship. And we see this every day. You know, we, we try to, we put ourselves first and we think we are the most important thing that exists. And the problem with this is that it won't satisfy that need we have. That spiritual void still will exist. And this is one of the hidden forms of idol worship of today. Another form of idol worship for today in today's 21st century is materialism. We're told that success is defined by material goods. The amount of money that you have, the amount of buildings that you have, how big your house is, the amount of vehicles that you have, the amount of influence that you have, all of these things that you accumulate is seen as a sign of success. And even today, if we reflect, we have these huge vast malls where people come to congregate and they buy these materialist, materialistic things in order to satisfy that need. Why? Because as human beings we want to be happy and we think by being materialistic that we will be balanced and we'll be satisfied spiritually. Unfortunately that's not the case and we see many examples of this. For example the great comedian uh, of, the, of, of the past, Robin Williams, great comedian, great actor, amazing films that he's produced. Yet his, most of his life he was depressed. And in fact, he died of depression. How sad. Yet he had everything. He had reached the pinnacle of, of his arena. The same with Jim Carrey. He was a person 
he is a person, right, who's reached the pinnacle. And he made, makes a famous quote, and I'm going to read it. It says, I think everyone should get rich and famous so, and do everything that they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it is not the answer. So here Jim Carrey is telling us, like, being rich and famous is not going to give you that satisfaction that you're looking for. It's not going to satisfy the inner core self, the spiritual aspect to our lives. So, dear friends, true happiness in our lives can only be attained by fulfilling the purpose for what we were created for. And it's not going to be fulfilled by materialism or individualism or by worshipping the idols of the past or even modern day idols. We truly need to understand who we are as human beings. We are complex beings. Like I said, we are mental, physical, spiritual beings. And the only way we're going to find peace, the only way we're going to find happiness is by putting our trust into the one that deserves our worship. That is Almighty God. And it is mentioned in the Holy Quran in chapter 13, verse 28, where God Almighty says, Those who have faith and whose hearts find peace in the remembrance of God, truly it is in the remembrance of God that hearts find peace. And this is what we need to do. Is we need to submit ourselves completely to the one that created the whole universe and the cosmos and everything within it. And that was the God of Abraham, right? And that's what Abraham did. Now, if we go back to that story of Abraham, where he smashed all the idols, and he was trying to get his community to use reason to reflect and think about what they are worshipping and who truly deserves our worship. Unfortunately, the society did not agree with Abraham. And what they decided to do was cast him into this great fire. And what they did was they built a fire so huge that they couldn't go anywhere near it. So they decided to slingshot him into this fire. Now just imagine that scene for a second. He's a young man, a young boy. And he's going to be flung into this huge, enraging fire. Yet at that moment, what did the prophet Abraham do? He put his trust and he loved Almighty God. He was patient. So as he was flung into that fire, imagine if it was me and you, we'd be scared, we'd be terrified. He had pure trust in Almighty God. In fact, whilst he was being flung, an angel came up to him and asked him, do you need help? And his response was, from you, no. But from Almighty God, yes. And that was the God of Abraham. He understood and he knew that our gratitude, our love, our thanks must be directed to the one that really deserves it. Everything that we have is a result of Almighty God. And this is the God of Abraham. This is mentioned in the Quran, in the 112th chapter, where Almighty God describes himself. And Almighty God says, Say he is God, the one and only, the eternal and absolute. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like to him. So here God is describing himself, the one that deserves our worship, that he is God that is one. He is eternal. He has no beginning, he has no end. He has no children, he has no parents. And he is unlike anything, meaning he's immaterial. He's not part of the creation. So stop worshipping created things. Stop worshipping idols that are created by your hands. Stop worshipping human beings that are created beings. Yes, they achieve amazing things, but our ultimate level of gratitude and thanks must go to Almighty God. All our blessings are as a result of Almighty God. So, you know, dear friends, that story of Prophet Abraham is phenomenal because what happened was as he got flung into the fire, what happened was Almighty God commanded the fires to be cooled and made it comfortable for the Prophet Abraham. And he walked out of that fire. The society were dumbfounded. Here, 
Abraham had put his trust and understood that Almighty God was the one that had to be truly worshipped. And it's no different today. So that story is really dear to my heart. Because just like Abraham, I myself was born into a society that worshipped idols. I too went to temples where you had these huge idols that were being worshipped. I too went to these idol worshipping ceremonies. Yet as I got older and I began to reason and reflect, I began to understand that these idols are useless, they hold no power. And when someone gave me the message of the prophets, the message of Abraham, the message of Islam that states that there is only one God that's worthy of worship and he is not part of the creation. I instinctively knew that was the truth and I accepted Islam. And it's been an amazing blessing. So just like the Prophet Abraham tried to get his people to reason and reflect, I implore you to use the same abilities, the abilities to reason, the ability to reflect. And think about your lives. Who is really deserving of worship and gratitude in your life? And if you follow things through, you will quickly come to the conclusion that it is Almighty God that deserves our love, our gratitude and worship. So, in conclusion, what I would like to say is that there is none worthy of worship except Almighty God alone and that he is deserving of our love, our gratitude and our thanks. All our blessings that we hold in our life, that we hold dear, every single moment, every single heartbeat is a result of Almighty God. So put your trust and thanks into Almighty God. Thank you for listening. My name is Salahuddin Patel. And if you want to find out more, please click the link in the description. And may the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon you all.